Well, that's strange. Broadcasting straight to you from a large spaceship currently hovering over an alien refugee camp in Johannesburg, South Africa. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Strange World, where the truth is often stranger than fiction. I'm your host, Mark Sargent, the creator of Flat Earth Clues, which propose that all of us are living inside a Truman Show structure thousands of miles wide. Check it out at enclosedworld.com or just Google Flat Earth Clues. My wingman for the show is Jonathan from Jersey. How's it going, Jonathan? Doing good. Thanks for having me back once again. Yeah. Feels yeah. like just yesterday we were talking about movies and the apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it feels like just like it was yesterday. <laughs> and today is a special show because uh, uh, it is our first guest. Uh, you know, we, this, we, we haven't been doing the show this long, and uh, uh, our first guest is a big one. And I am so happy to, to have him on here. Uh, because he is a guy that I have mentioned many times over interviews. Um, either e- either I bring it up or the interview brings it up, but we seem to be destined to cross, cross paths sooner or later, and that's uh, Crow777 from YouTube. And uh, for those of you who don't know, and I'm gonna, we're just going to rattle it off, who is Crow777? Um, Crow holds a degree in Internet technology, having worked in the digital field since the 90s, similar to me, He has now made the commitment to pursue his passions, which are lunar anomalies, chemtrails, deception, and space anomaly research. Which this and this is a far cry because he started out in the U.S. Marine as a U.S. Marine during the first Gulf War. Uh, Upon separation from the military, he spent ten years as a roadie. It'd be great if we could actually talk about that at one point. uh, Working for some of the most well-known music acts on the planet. Whether or not we'll divulge who those bands are, we'll, we'll, we'll find out later. In 1995, Crow purchased the 8-inch robotic telescope that began his research. He recalls seeing the moons of Jupiter for the first time through this, this telescope, at which point he was hooked. His fascination with the unknown has never diminished. Fast forward all the way to the supermoon of May 2012. On this night, Crow had gathered uh, with family to view the moon's closest approach to Earth for the year. It was this occasion that ended up changing everything in his life. That night, Crow and family members witnessed black triangles transiting the full moon through his 8-inch telescope using a 26mm eyepiece. This went on for hours and culminated in the observation of five to seven of the objects in formation. Following the supermoon in 2012, Crow purchased the equipment needed to couple his camera with his telescope. He has been filming astounding HD footage ever since, and I'm, I'm first-hand witnesses. He has fantastic footage. Crow is currently best known for his high-def videos of space-based UFOs, chemtrail UFOs, exposing the age of deception, and most notably, and what I mentioned in, in many interviews, the first and best capture of what he calls the lunar wave, which may be a facade or projection covering the moon itself, hiding a secret. He has filmed this event five times to date, with another 13 recorded from nine other videographers. Crow is currently working to inform the public of his findings, and has stated that with the right equipment, he could change the world in a year. So, without further ado, introducing Crow... Are you there, Crow? I am, and uh, thanks for having me. Hey, I'm I'm super thrilled to have you. It's it's fantastic. Again, you know, I I, I I've mentioned enough times, and I was just thrilled that we finally connected, and uh, you know, here we are. So let's let's get right to it, man. Uh, how you know, other other than what I just read in the bio, is there anything you want to add as like how you got started uh, in the in this field? Well, really, the super moon of uh, 2012. Uh, before I had the ability to film is what what started what I'm doing now. Um, After I saw that, uh, I went out and I got a a T-ring and and the adapter I needed to couple my camera at the time, which was only 18 megapixels. And, uh, you know, to be honest, at the time I started, I thought I'll never see or film anything like that again. And as fate would have it, I did actually film one of those black triangles sometime later. I call it the boomerang. It is posted. But that's basically how... Uh, what led me uh, to to the moment 
to now. Okay. Okay. Cool. Uh, uh, with how in. Let me ask you this, because we, we talked briefly about the, the lunar wave in the, in the intro. Uh, the rumor has it you predicted the last wave, which was filmed by a different astronomer. Uh, how how'd you pull this off? Well, this, this is a success story and a tragedy as well. Um, first of all, the research that I've done, uh, coupled with the only corroboration that I have to go on the record with, um, there are a lot of people who have reviewed, I mean, every walk of life. We've had CCD chip engineers, uh, camera designers, PhDs, because we've, we've had everybody looking at this, but no one wants to touch it um, for fear of, you know, damaging their career or, or the people that they work with. But when the Russian research came forward and three of the things I had come to know, uh, one of which was that the wave would probably occur near equinoxes, mm -hmm. um, Everything I had come to know in conjunction with the Russian research that I got in 2015 led me to believe that the vernal equinox was the big deal and the following month to the first full moon, or what we call Easter, um, would be an absolute increase in objects transiting the moon and the best chance to film the lunar wave. And as fate would have it, a gentleman in Texas did film the lunar wave. He would caught one previous, so he was actively working to capture the lunar wave. Um, we had talked and he had modified how he was shooting so that it was HD and more full frame instead of close shots of the moon. But the tragedy is that he sent me uh, what he had gotten and I was filming that night and when he filmed the lunar wave, my camera was off for a number of minutes and I did the time correction. So um, what we've been trying to do is get two simultaneous captures of the lunar wave, which has to date not happened, to, you know, determine is this something we see from a local point of view? If someone was, you know, a thousand miles away, would they see what I'm seeing? Um, and it was literally just a fluke that I had turned off my camera, um, and then within the few minutes that I had my camera off, he captured the wave in Texas. So. Wow. That's what happened. Wow, fantastic! Uh, it's it's just amazing. Yeah, for for those of you who haven't seen it, uh, definitely, and I'll, I'll do plugs throughout the show. Uh, you know, go on YouTube and look up Crow Triple Seven. Uh, that's C R R O W Triple Seven. Although, if you just put in the you know the word Crow, you know, without the double R Triple Seven, it comes up too. Uh, and look up Lunar Waves uh, on, on his channel. It's just amazing to watch. Um, but quick, quick question. Do, do, do you ever notice times of the year or times that seem to indicate patterns in, in what you're filming? Do you, do you see any regularities, any routines? Yeah, I mean, there, there's, there's a lot to what you just said, and so I'll try to kind of boil it down because it's not that simple. Um, I will state that there are times of the year where I am um, – and you got to realize that daylight savings time plays into this. Um, anyhow, at 8.30 at night around this time of the year is when we start to see things transit, when we're in a period when a lot of transits are going to occur. Mm -hmm. Now, this will shift at times to begin up around 9.30. So it's in this general vicinity, and you've got to realize that at the fall equinox of 2012, three days before the full moon, when I filmed the best lunar wave, um, that was at 8.30 mm -hmm. um, at night. But having said that, anytime we have a lunar eclipse, yeah. and I've filmed the last three, um, there have been occasions where we have seen literally hundreds of transits that night as the lunar eclipse is about to happen while it's happening. And there were others who confirmed this that were shooting. Yeah. So, I mean, there's the kind of simple boiled response. There's absolutely a pattern. Um, I'm kind of working to try to work out in a year cycle, you know, what that pattern is. Got it. You know, it, it's funny you mention that because uh, I have gone out, and I don't tell a lot of people this on interviews, but uh, I've spent a lot of time with uh, night vision binoculars um, out, you know, out here in the Colorado skies. And there's, for me, you know, I went out for years. And for me, there seemed to be a point of, uh, you know, like an hour 
point you know any i called it rush hour but if it was uh if it was spring forward you know daylight saving spring forward it was like between 7 30 and 8 30 at night and if it was fall back it was between 6 30 and 7 30 at night where there just seemed to be a, a huge increase in traffic and what was flying across the sky which i absolutely knew they weren't satellites given you know what i was looking at so well i, I would like to add something to that uh, many people you know who aren't familiar with what goes on because they just don't have the experience. Um, they see the footage that I have and they do what a reasonable person would do and say, those are satellites. The truth is, is that it is almost e- the hardest thing to film is yeah. the lunar wave. There's no doubt, oh, but no it is doubt. almost easier to film a lunar wave than it is to film a satellite transiting the moon and then be able to identify it. Got it. Now, there's got to be a lot of satellites that are not listed. I mean, that's a given. But the point is, um, I kind of recognize, you know, the, the rules we're given about orbits is low Earth orbit is just fast. You know, we hear numbers like 17,000 miles an hour and all these other things. Yeah. Um, anyone who's ever seen what we are told is supposed to be an international space station that transits the moon in less than a second. I don't know what it is we're looking at. It looks like we think it should look, given the description we've been handed. Um, But my point is um, most satellites, we are told, are in low Earth orbit. So these things that we're filming that are all a range of sizes, many black round things with halos, they're not following the rules of orbit that we've been handed. Yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Ab- absolutely. Uh, John, John, you had one? Yeah, I was wondering, um, has NASA or anyone in the established astronomical, um, you know, said what the wave is? Have they tried to, or of course, deter you, uh, tell, tell you what it is? <laughs> no, you know, that's kind of a funny thing. Um, you know, it was the third, third clip up or so on my channel, um, and I got a lot of attention quick. I've had observatories early on contact me, among others and uh, tell me how unprofessional I am and that I shouldn't call myself an amateur astronomer. But no one from officialdom uh, offered anything. And so what I finally did is I did a clip on the waves to date, however many that was, five or six. And I asked my viewers to contact their local observatories and other things and, you know, demand some answers. One response came from, I think it was Norway or somewhere in that part of the world, and it was kind of a very short, terse response that said it's absolutely atmosphere, um, which is a bit disappointing because that ignores that the 2012 footage and one other footage was shot early enough at night that we can demonstrate uh, it's that the wave is not crossing the video frame, goes to the edge of the moon, um, among other things. So really that's the only response from any official type place we've had. Wow. Wow. And so they, they claim, just so I'm getting this straight, they say it's an atmospheric anomaly, that it has nothing to do with anything. It's, <laughs> it's, it's strictly what it, – did they even give, um, uh, you know, in your opinion, more of a – you know, it, it, anything more than – like what, a heat wave, a mirage? Uh, no, I, I think maybe the, the response that he wrote was interrupting his coffee break or something. And, you know, it's not like there was a lot of effort put into this, which is kind of underscores – what's going on here any person that sees the 2012 footage and that is by miles the best footage we have and the russian research speaks to this you know that uh, it would always happen in the third phase of the moon or near full all those things he said up to 2012 is what this gentleman said Uh, but anyhow uh, you know anyone who sees that a reasonable person is going to go what the heck did i just see and, of course, they're going to go through the normal human course of, you know, what common thing can I assign to this thing I've just seen? They're going to go through that process. Yeah. But when you look at the research I've done, uh, there's an energy pulse on the moon where you can clearly see, right as the wave is starting, curved lines going around a sphere. Yeah. There's actually a bow in the, you know, the waves come in twos for those who have seen it. Yeah. Um, there's a bow, a measurable bow in the 2012 wave. And so... You know, there it is. Yeah, yeah. You pointed you pointed out the bow, and I thought that was really interesting because um, uh, you, because most people wouldn't have seen it right off the bat. You know, if they're looking at a small monitor, if they don't have it cranked up, you know, to the highest resolution. But yeah, the first thing, and w- which is why I mentioned it to just about everybody I can. You know, because people ask me about the moon all the time, and you know, I'll, I'll give you the quote that I give them. You've probably heard it by now, and that is, look, if you want to 
cast doubt on on what your impression of the moon is you've got to watch this footage you know at the very least and i know some people you know they watch it on a tablet or a phone but it's like look at the very least you've got to acknowledge that that wave exists and if the and, and for me it reminded me of and again i'm sure you've heard heard this uh comparison before it reminded me of you know the movie cameras uh, when when people made the mistake when when um, motion pictures made the mistake of filming television cam or, or televisions you know and there was a vertical refresh right. uh, you know a vertical hold um, uh, out of sync thing and that's what it reminded me of you know coming from the gaming world and the tech world I was going I, you know that's the first thing I said it out loud I'm going why I go, why is there a refresh issue with the moon why 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 is this happening and and then it's just started to hit me I'm, and yeah as I said the same thing that most uh, well, uh, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I, I would add, you know, you, you you just said what a lot of people try to use as a, as a way to describe this for those who haven't seen it. Yeah. But the astounding thing about that 2012 footage is it is so well-defined, so yeah. clean, yeah. so organic. And I'll, I'll tell you what happened to me. The night that I filmed that, um, I was looking at the back of a Canon T2i uh, with 18 megapixels, the little LCD screen. That's how I was doing it back then before I had all my modern, more modern stuff. When it happened, I thought for sure my brand new Canon T2i was failing. Mm -hmm. And what's funny is, is I do have a degree in internet technology and it gnawed on me and I reached over to delete that clip, but for some reason I didn't. Well, this for a couple weeks or more, maybe close to a month, it was gnawing on me and I kept going back and looking at it. Finally, one day I said, you know what, to hell with it. I deleted the clip because, you know, disk space is always a premium when you're shooting high def video. Yeah. That night I had the epiphany because for those who have seen it, what, just by chance, right before the wave started, I panned the camera in a way I never do. And you can see all my footage to verify what I'm telling you. I always try to keep the moon centered. Sometimes I go side to side. For some reason, I panned the camera down below the moon. The wave started, didn't notice it. I panned above the wave, and the wave caught up to the camera. Yeah. Now, I had that epiphany, jumped out of bed, rebooted, um, you know, restored the clip out of my trash can, and it scared the hell out of me at first because it all hit me at once that, damn, this is a filmed event, damn, this is local to the moon, and double damn, it has nothing to do with equipment. Um, digital things do not fail in an organic way. Yeah. And so wait, so you almost deleted this thing? I did delete it. I almost <laughs> deleted it off the camera. Had I done that, it would have been gone for good, oh, um, which oh. is also uh, kind of a trippy thing because I have never reached for the delete button and not pushed it on my camera. Um, you know, when you shoot as much video as I do, disk space is always a concern. You only want to keep what you want to keep. Yeah. So I didn't do it that time. But yeah, when it was on my computer, I chucked that sucker in the trash. Wow. Can I can I add a comment to that? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. What do you? Um, well, because I'm a photographer and I do some video and. Um, I was thinking, you know how most people they say that you know you get that Kodak moment, that one in a million shot. Yeah. Uh, it seems it seems we can coin a new phrase here for for anybody into conspiracy. We can call this a Toto moment, where <laughs> it's like you know when Toto pulled back the curtain, yeah, in the Wizard of Oz, and yeah. you know the the wizard had the four people intimidated not to look, you know, to, to be in fear, kind of like NASA does. What you know, this is the truth, and you're going to listen to this. And here he comes along and, and looks behind the curtain. And they're like, no, 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 don't look back here, and it's too late now. Yeah, it, it's kind of with the flatter, and they don't want to acknowledge it when when you stumble upon the truth. It seems. Uh, they won't give you an answer or a nod because they don't want to bring um, d debate and discussion on, on a serious issue like this. Yeah. No, they don't want attention. But, you know, the, the beautiful thing about what's happened here is truth does not need defending. Truth Agreed. is what exactly. it is. And even if I have misdescribed things, um, if I have not hit the bullseye and what I've tried to do, it really doesn't matter. Um, what's been filmed is out there. Um, you know, here's another thing. Uh, on my channel, I think it's the second most viewed clip. And the funny thing is, is it's not even to 300,000 hits. I was covertly contacted, I don't even know how long ago, probably over a year, where uh, I was sent a, a URL and uh, said, go look at this. And someone had embedded that the correct way, you know, correctly, cl correctly embedded my clip so that I can get traffic and everything. Mm -hmm. And the counter on his site said a million, over a million hits. And I thought, really? Um, 
And I thought, come on. I mean, I'm not even at that time. I wasn't even clocking anything near that through the analytics on YouTube. Yeah. And so, you know, I went back, looked. Then about, I don't know, a week or two later, I went back to look again. The site was gone. Um, wow. So it, it, it's there's been so much that has gone on around this clip that, you know, I could really speculate, you know, what's going on behind the scenes. But yeah. just suffice it to say that when I had no followers and it was one of the first clips up on my site, I was immediately getting all kinds of attention that I never expected. Wow. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, hey, uh, and on that note, uh, how, just just out of curiosity, how many times uh, has the lunar wave been filmed? Not not just by you, but but anyone. Okay, so I, I think when you did the intro, I think it's nine of us total. Okay. Um, and to be, I, I haven't looked at this for like now a couple of weeks, but I believe we are at thirteen captures. Um, a couple of them uh, out of Texas were filmed more than once by the same guy. There's a guy who runs a channel called Richard 205 Maria, uh -huh. he's caught it more than once. And, and in, incidentally, the last time he caught it, which was recently on a night that I couldn't film because chemtrails had closed the sky, he caught it on the East Coast. And uh, he's got these kind of black haloed objects that I film. He's got one of those, or maybe it's two of those. I think it's one of those going by in that footage. Yeah. In the vicinity of the wave, I have two clips that have objects going by in the vicinity of the wave. And in the 2012 footage, there's kind of a shadowy thing that goes on four seconds after the first wave begins. So, wow, wow, and and uh, out of, out of those people, I mean, how many how many different uh, um, uh, two questions? How one? How many different countries, or you know, or is it all in the states? Uh, that's the first question. So the first confirmation, independent of me, was some German footage that was done with just, I think, something like a Sony Handycam. Mm -hmm. Now, the funny thing about that footage is, is every wave that I have vetted and called legitimate is in pairs. That is kind of a fingerprint of the lunar wave, is that it comes in pairs. Now, this German footage, which was the first guy, kept waiting for someone else to get it. Mm -hmm. Ironically, there was a guy who had it posted since 2013. Okay. Um, I guess that guy doesn't care much for me now. But anyhow... Um, <laughs> The, the German footage kind of showed these very distinct ripples going up, and there were more than two, and, but you could see the line across the face of the moon. So um, I vetted that thing for like four days, did everything I could to it, and finally said, I believe we're looking at something akin to the lunar wave, if not. Um, but after that, everything I believe has been shot in the U.S. Okay. Uh, any, uh, and, and on, on that note, uh, any uh, well, actually, I, I've got another follow-up question. Uh, did did everybody? I'm I'm sure you did because you're a big camera guy. Did you ask what their you know check everybody's equipment as far as like make a list? It's like okay, this guy shot it with this. This guy shot it with this. Um, you know, each time it was done, we did have that discussion, and I could get the information. I don't actually have a running list of equipment per se, but it was broached, and you know, we know who everyone is that has shot it. Um, the German footage came with a very good description. Um, Richard 205, Maria, I talk to him all the time. I'm aware of what he's using, mm -hmm. as is two people, in uh, one in Houston and another one, I think, somewhere else in Texas. Mm -hmm. So uh, the answer is yes, we can easily know what all that is, uh, but I, I don't have Oh, no, no, no. I, I wasn't asking, you know, for, for a list necessarily. I was just curious if, if they mentioned, you know, uh, that, that – that, is everybody shooting with different things as far as you know yes, just saying because absolutely. because that gives more credibility to anything because you know of course you've gotten it so many times like oh it's a camera issue it's a camera issue but if there's if it's being shown with multiple cameras all in different locations like well then it can't then it's all cameras you know if it's if they're all showing it yeah well i mean the other part of that is when when i caught the 2012 footage my canon t2i was brand new mm -hmm. um and here's what happened i shot in the fall at the equinox of 2012 and i said wow and when i realized so i shot nonstop. i didn't see anything for a year and a half until the vernal just before the vernal or spring equinox of 2014. at that time i caught an additional three waves and then one slightly after the equinox and the only wave that i and i hope i'm getting this right but the one wave at a certain point uh, while I was doing the count through everything that had happened mm -hmm. that is not right at an equinox is one month 
or not quite a month after the summer solstice. So that one kind of stands alone. But again, I would have to go through because there's so many now, um, but most are happening um, near equinoxes as, as I predicted and as the Russian re- research predicts. Wow. Um, well, two minutes to the break. And I, I do have one more little side question on that uh, because uh, you, know, you would know. And that is, has anyone given you, had, has anyone tried to submit to you obvious fakes or stuff that you have discovered? They say, oh yeah, I filmed the lunar wave and then you dug into it and you, you tore it apart. Well, um, yes, kind of. I've had a lot of videos submitted that is simply seeing. Um, For those who use telescopes, what seeing is is kind of turbulence or heat exchange in the atmosphere that makes it look very wavy. Uh Um, But it's nowhere near as defined as as a lunar wave. Um, But what I have had, uh, when I finally went and joined a place that will do video tracking, is at one point there were 25 channels that had taken the 2012 footage, put it in After Effects, and were telling people they had replicated it in After Effects, when in fact what they'd done was just loaded the untouched lunar wave. Um, So there was a concerted effort to try to demonstrate that I was committing fraud. Got it, got it. I I completely understand. Okay, so one minute to the break, and uh, rather than go into the next question, because I I love all your answers, super detailed, um, I'm just going to plug your your channel one more time, uh, which is, uh, for those of you who want to see really interesting footage of the moon, uh, please go on YouTube and look up uh, Crow777, that's C-R-R-O-W-777, and more specifically, or you could just look up uh, Lunar Wave on YouTube, or even Google Lunar Wave, I think, at this point. And it will show you some amazing stuff. And basically, what the, the summary here is is a band, a, a a fluctuating wave that starts at the bottom and moves through the entire moon uh, more than once. And uh, it can only be seen from when you know with, with you know an HD camera at close range. And uh, it's it's fascinating, fascinating to see. I absolutely encourage everybody to check that thing out. So going to break, and we will be back with more Crow 777 and ask him more about the moon, NASA, and all sorts of fun stuff. So we'll be right back. Welcome back to Strange World. I'm your host, Mark Sargent, with Wingman Jonathan. We are talking with Crow 777 about the moon, lunar waves, and all the great stuff behind it. Absolutely, if you get a chance, check out his web page well i was like do you i'm sorry i didn't even ask you this this is so rude of me did do do you have a, a web page that we can go to i actually did um but it, it's just a cost and it wasn't really doing much um oh, okay. in, in terms of communicating with people so i i just let it lapse so send people to the youtube channel that's the only place i'm doing it and i have completely quit facebook although you can find me there i am just tired of the nazi regime that's kicked me out three <sighs> times for no reason and then demanded picture ID to reinstate me finally. So they've they've kicked you out of Facebook three times. I, 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 well, I'm sorry. I normally I'd go on to my next question, but I've, I've got to ask uh, uh, what what happened. If you don't, do you mind talking about it? I opened up the the Facebook, um, and you know I never uh, look. Um, data mining is a real thing, and for those of us with technical degrees and technical know how, they understand what social media is about. And I am completely 100% against it. I set up Facebook not really wanting to for other reasons, and I opened it under Crow 777. So what I did was wrote first name Crow and then, you know, the rest of it out as a a written name. Well, the first time they came at me, they said, you got to have a real name. But they shut me down and said, you got to have a real name. So I reverted to my real name, Crow Triple Horn. And at that point, it ran for a while. Then they said, this isn't a real name. And I said, the hell it isn't. And uh, um, (laughs) they shut me down again. So finally, after I raged at them for a day or two, they reinstated me. Lo and behold, uh, one day I came and they put me through, and I'm not kidding, a security check. Now, I had thousands of friends who I'd never met as Facebook works, and their security check was, we're going to put pictures of these people you call friends up and you have to identify their names. So, and I'll give everyone a tip um, on how to get by this BS. The first time, clearly I failed it, and they said, you can try this again in so many hours or something like that. So then what I did is I opened up a reverse image search on Google, 
and I quickly dragged and dropped and ID'd the people that way because I have no way to remember thousands of friends I've never met yeah. and uh, passed the security check. Um, at which point they let me back in but said I had to produce a picture ID for full in statement. Oh, man. Wow. Wow. Okay. <laughs> And and I'm gonna segue that right into uh, this one, which which you you should be fully uh, prepared for. And oh, that by is... the way, I want to say I just want to say one thing. I appreciate what you've done because I'm a, I'm a gray hat. I wear a gray hat, and I've been in IT for years. So uh, bravo to you for doing that. <laughs> That's the crow. <laughs> right on. So um, so yeah, not only are you getting uh, hit by the establishment and and related uh, organizations, but uh, debunkers are coming after you. Uh, and which, you know, I, you know, I have yet to run into any, which is amazing to me considering the stuff I'm proposing, but you're getting, you're getting hit on a regular basis. Is it, is it, it's more or less true? Yeah. But what's funny about that, um, is, well, let me start with kind of a slightly related topic. Okay. Um, because a big part of what I do is trying to help people wake up to the age of deception. Mm -hmm. You know, basically everything you know is wrong. Yeah. YouTube had a star system for rating their videos, mm -hmm. and what they did was switch to thumbs up and thumbs down. Now, on the face of it, this might not seem like much, but I would point out, in the corporate world, when a big place like Facebook had already invented that and been using it, something like YouTube doing it, there would have been a battle in, in real life. But anyhow, the reason this is done is to introduce divisiveness in people. Yeah. Um, that is the sole reason thumbs up. The whole time I have been on uh, the Internet, I have never thumbs down to anything. And this segues into what you asked me. Mm -hmm. If I don't like something, it's like watching TV. You change the channel. Yeah. You know, you don't expend energy on that. Yeah. Now, the people who have been coming after me um, will say things like, I'm going to debunk you. And then 27 videos in a row later, you know, and I'm not even – or 24 videos in a row later, um, you know, they're, they're still at it. So what you see here um, is clearly just attack for attack's sake. Yeah. If I was a crazy person, no one would expend energy. You know, why would you respond to someone who's clearly, you know, smoking too much opium? But, yeah, yeah the, the attacks are endless, and I even had to implement video tracking, which is completely independent of me. Um, it just happens because there's just too many to follow. But I hope that kind of answers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. You come across as very rational, and that's when you get yourself into trouble. Because if you if you come across as as a as a, a true tin hatter, you know, uh, uh, a person that's that's you know goes on some some pretty big jags, and they they sound incoherent. You know, the credibility goes down really really fast. But you're about you know one of the most credible guys I've ever heard. I mean, you you've got the tech background. You, you've got the mechanical background. You, you, you're ex-military, and you've taken you know great stuff, absolutely great stuff. And uh, so yeah, no no wonder you know, you're catching some flack. Um, can it, I add, can I add one thing to that? Yeah, I was always under the impression that if you're too successful and they can't debunk you or stop you, eventually they give you a radio show first and then a TV show, <laughs> and then they just you know phone speed you and hand you the script. Can I name names? <laughs> no, you cannot name names. That would be liable. He just, he just did your bio, Mr. Sergeant. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Don't get me wrong. I was thinking about somebody else who believed in the movie. No, no. I, no, it is, it is true. But at, at, at the same time, uh, uh, yeah, I have yet to uh, – and that part has, has sort of worried me. And, again, this, is, this is, show isn't about me. It's about you. But, yeah, I have been kind of concerned <laughs> because – because yeah, you've caught you've caught some flack from some some pretty big. Um, uh, di didn't didn't you tell me at one point you you've you've gotten some some hit you know some some grief from some uh, some bigger players in in the conspiracy world? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, e even this thing um, with the the other flat Earth guy who's telling everyone that I'm a paid disinfo agent. Yeah. You know, it's it's a bit astounding because many of the people some of them have spoke with me some of them even started out on good terms yeah. um when i came to say the moon is not what you think some of their brains exploded and they said this isn't going to fly yeah. and the thought police came in but what you see is you know labeling someone a disinfo agent i see it all the time 
And, uh, you know, this is what we're talking about now is the very reason that you will never find me in the flat earth argument. Yeah. Um, it is beyond comprehension yeah. to watch the fight that goes on when everybody <laughs> is arguing about the same thing. Uh, so you're, you're preaching but, to the choir, man. Yeah, well, absolutely. What I would mention yeah. is I say publicly the description of this place we live has been intentionally misgiven. Yes. Um, and sure. further than that, there was a reason behind it. But the point is, um, when you see so much arguing over <laughs> minutia, convex, concave, flat, ice wall, you know, all these things that go on, and at the root of it, the important part of the argument is we've been lied to on a very foundational level, which introduces error, which is much of why this world of deception is the way it is. Yeah has introduced error into the foundation of your existence. So just for the record, that's why, you know, you're not going to find me in, in that kind of uh, arena. Oh, no, no, I, 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 I totally hear you. And, uh, I, and again, I was really surprised because I caught grief. Not only were you, were you catching grief on your side, your grief was spilling over to me, which I thought was amazing because literally by the time I had done my second interview, the um the the Eric and I'm not gonna pick you know I'm not gonna pick you know start a cat fight here but but the Eric debate camp I was getting Eric supporters that were were saying look Eric's really upset that you're talking about Crow Triple Seven and it's going why why what what does that got to do with anything well, you, you know what's kind of stunning about you know that which kind of on the face of it shows um, the problem with what they're doing yeah. is anyone anyone can do what I'm doing. Um, if you have decent stuff to film with, yeah. you don't even really need a very good telescope. Yeah. It takes one ingredient, your life. Your patience, yeah. <laughs> your your freaking life. Yeah. You know, I sit here sometimes for 40 hours having caught nothing. And so what's ironic is a paid disinfo agent better be getting paid really well to sit in front of a telescope for endless hours to get often some in, insignificant piece of video that might be a minor puzzle piece or might not, yeah. um, it just kind of frames the whole argument in my mind. Can I, can I add two points to that? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll tell you what, uh, you know, everybody has a past, right? So I used to do research uh, way back when, 80s, 90s, and I'll never forget, I was with somebody who was a doctor, geologist, paleontologist, uh, accredited, you know, you name it, he, he had clout. Started getting into a particular field of research. <clears throat> we met another gentleman who also, uh, PhD, the whole nine yards, and we met at a conference in New York. Uh, the subject was crop circles. And I won't say who this man's name is, you know, what his name is, but he tells my friend, he says, listen, he goes, they're, they're, they're paying me now. And he goes, what do you mean? He says, yeah, he goes, they're, they're, they told me a deal. You can be the top. You can be the, you know, the, the keynote speaker on all this. We'll put you on TV, everything. You'll be the lead guy to field all these questions. We'll tell you what to say. And my friend looked at him and says, what are you, what are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, he goes, they're going to make you an offer. Don't worry. Because his research was that sound, and and literally my friend's life went from what he was doing to you know stepping stones into the the biggest field of research, and then eventually when they were done with him, they were done with him. But it's amazing, like you said too, um, semantics. So many so many issues that we we argue on in these forums and all that. It's just a matter of semantics. We, we we're all talking about the same thing, but we're coming from different angles. And at the core of it is the issue, like you said, we're just being lied to. Why don't we just focus on that? Yeah. And we, well, and it's, it's, it's a simple thing, Jonathan. If they have you fighting, if they have you at odds, if they have your brain wasting cycles on anything beyond deception, then what they're doing is working. Yeah. Right. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, the division, and it's so, and I've said this before, it's so easy to create division in the conspiracy world because, you know, the, the, the tr trust is hard to come by. Let, let's face it. It's uh, you know we're naturally suspicious. Some way more than others. Uh, you know I'm not going to name names, but there's a guy out there that I I know of that could could get a lot of attention, but he trusts no one, and uh, you know to the point where he's not you know he yeah he claims people are disinfo agents, but he also just won't he won't do interviews. Can I can I say something about you though, Mark? Okay. You're, you're a nice guy. You're a genuinely nice guy, and I'm not just saying that because I like you. Because oh, I don't. You. Thank you. I, <laughs> you dragged me into this, and now now it's part of my life. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I'd like to see you and Eric Dubay or any go in the ring, kind of like Spock and Kirk playing that music. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> and go it's, at I, I it. I think you come out. <laughs> you know, like like that famous scene with Spock and Kirk. Two men enter, one man leaves. There you go, Thunderdome. Even better. Yeah. 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 You, you know what I'd like to see? What? I'd like to see 
people get into a ring and say, hey, man, can we have a common level agreement on this playing field that at the base of what everyone is saying, we are talking about a deception that has been implemented against a global population yep. so that they have no clue about the foundational information that every human being has the right to know. Wow. Well put. Is that like a gentleman's debate? Is that like with couth and rules and <laughs> handshakes? <laughs> <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, yeah, it's that and and that's an excellent point, Crow. Uh you're absolutely right. The it it is all about the the grand deception, whatever that grand deception is. For me, it's, you know, it's an enclosed system. I have no no doubt that this the, that most of this world is is well, let's just call it what it is, a giant lie that's been that's been ha- handed to us for a long time. We bought it. It, it, well, you, well, you know what's funny is, you know, I, I just did an interview with Kelly Coffee, which I know you did, and yeah. a lot of people's immediate response was, um, "Why did you do an interview with her? Um, she's not in in any relationship to the work you do." And I kind of found that stunning, and it helped me further cement the commitment that the interviews that I am most interested in are people that I have very little in common with. Otherwise, you end up speaking to people who are already here in the first place. There you go. And if someone is polite, in my mind, that's all I care about. Yeah. I'm not going to vet them. I'm not going to judge them. If they can have a conversation at a civil level, that's all I need. And I think it's actually a better thing to expend interview time on someone who has next to nothing in common with you. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree, and that's that's the same reason uh, I I did her show as well. And that is, look, I don't care what you're into. I mean, com- again, coming from, look from the enclosed world, flat Earth movement. I mean, honestly, I'm open to anything, but that's what I look for. It's like, look, if you're open minded about things i want to talk to you i want to talk to you know whoever you're talking to because yeah you may be into astral projection you may be into lizard people but at the but the fact is is you're open-minded to new concepts and if you're open to yours you may be open to mine and see i I kind of view that in a slightly oblique more oblique angle where i'm not really talking to the interview i'm talking or the interviewer i'm talking with the interviewer but i'm really more interested in the audience there you go and i state all the time um do not let a video or uh you know anything be your truth don't believe anything i am telling you don't accept any of it i hope you will consider it and go out and look into it using your own personal experience to kind of vet value and authenticity yeah. so that's kind of the the tack that that i'm taking got it got it and and can i ask oh, yeah sorry, go ahead yeah no no go ahead man i, I just have one other one. um what what are the what what's the demographic you've found so far crow um with those who are open to this because i'm thinking of people like my father he's coming up on 70 and he believes that we landed on the moon and you know everything they tell him on tv <laughs> Well, it's funny. When my channel was young, my demographic was 45 and up. Um, now what's happened is, is I'm across the board, maybe a f- fewer very young people and fewer very old people. So the demographic, according to YouTube statistics, whatever the value is in that, is kind of, uh, you know, mid-20s up to, you know, mid-50s for the most part. But here's what I find. Um, if you want to learn how to understand that you need to let the blinders fall away from your eyes. The only way that I knew, know how to do that is one of the hardest things a human being can do. You have to shed belief. I say it over and over. Belief is the enemy of knowing. Belief is a thing you adopt without any investigation most times, um, any process. You just do it because you choose. Now, if you can simply say, I don't believe in anything I've ever been presented with, which is a very difficult thing to do, for about a year, the blinders will begin to fall away, and you will see with new eyes again. The real problem is is that you will constantly be tempted to fall back into the comfortable lifetime you've built over the whole time you've been here alive, which means that people who are older are going to have the hardest time because they have a longer lifetime of building what they thought to be correct. Yeah. And to cast that aside is to temporarily be without a foundation. And some people just can't handle that, and even people who are prepared to handle it are still going to have a rough time. And can I share something with that? Um, I have a son who's 11 and a half years old, 
and beautiful soul. He's just, you know, he's an individual. I'm not here to, I don't say he's my son, I own him. And therefore I'm his custodian here on earth and I have to teach him. And with that, I give him choices. And he says to me, you know, you never lie to me. And I said, and I said why do you think that is? He goes, because you love me. I said, well, what do you want to know? And he'll ask me questions about absolutely anything. So he knows, unfortunately, there is no Santa. His friends let him in on it. <laughs> but like even with the moon or anything else, he says, he'll, he'll say to me, he goes, the government's in on this, right? <laughs> or, you know, he'll question things. Or he'll, he'll read packages of uh, gum while we're online at the food market and say, this is aspartame. You know what that means. You know, so he's he's aware. He's He's got his blinders off. I didn't want to indoctrinate him improperly. In the, in, if it was up to, you know, I wish I had more control over his life, but yeah. it is what it is. Yeah. Um, in a good way, constructive way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, kind of what we see with the younger generation is somewhere around, I don't know, 94 or something, um, children began to show uh, the increase in human ability. You know, back in the 80s, they were referring to these children as indigo kids and all these other labels that they put on mm -hmm. this seemingly very rare event back then. What we see now is the younger generation is kind of in a very tough spot. Um, you and I can remember when it was fun to ride a plane. You and I can remember a time before everything digital. Now, the generation coming up, while they are going to have abilities that their parents never had, um, the problem is, is they have grown up where everything is done online. Now, this digital world that's being built around us is ultimate control, and not just on you know, the, the obvious level, but in terms of data mining and in terms of those who would control knowing everything about you, um, it's going to be a, a tough generation, this next generation coming in, these kids born, you know, mid-90s and, and past, but that's kind of where I see us. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And by the way, we're having a uh, – thank you for uh, having me in on this conversation, Mark. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, I'd love to have a, a true meeting with you know all of us without electronic devices in hand <laughs> or anywhere within 50 feet of us so we can talk openly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, so uh, just to, to segue into some of the other stuff because you, you, you not only have dealt with uh, uh, the lunar waves – but you've also dealt with some uh, – you've, you've taken some, some interesting videos about other stuff. Uh, one is chemtrails, and you've ta – you, and, and not many people will, will do both. You know, not many people will, will do night stuff and day stuff, but you do. And you've, um, you've taken some videos of, of chemtrails with some interesting things flying through them, yeah? Yeah, um, you know, chemtrails is kind of one of the major banes of our existence. This is a global thing, and um, – the real problem here is that the campaign that's been la launched to dissuade people of the validity of chemtrails has the majority of people convinced that all of a sudden planes leave, you know, these contrails, these ice crystals in the sky that turn our sky milky white. Yeah. Truth is, um, there are lab reports and all these other things from around the globe. Everywhere there's an, an Internet hookup, we see that chemtrails are going on. I just posted a video and I got comments from all over the planet saying they're nailing us hard. Having said that, one of the strange things about chemtrails is that early on when I began to film them, there was objects around um, and orbs, what is called orbs, these little white round things, mm -hmm. which some, some may not be so little. But um, at one point – I've seen one of those, by the way. Yeah, I mean, there was a time not too long ago, the day that I shot the very famous, my most viewed uh, clip, the shooting orb, mm -hmm. um, we could see them, many of them, with our naked eyes. We knew we were filming them, which is often not the case. Often you don't know till you get in the editing room what you've caught. Having said that, we shot the shooting orb, and what happens is an orb goes down into a chemtrail and fires like a plasma some kind of a, a like a, a I, I don't want to say weapon. It, it shoots something twice yeah. into the chemtrail. Now, since I shot that and posted it, we have shot precious few orbs. We've got flashes from very high altitude. It's almost as if the day that I posted that footage, um, it was decided that you know this needs to not be done in the open. Now, what they are, that's a whole other question. Yeah. You know, there's people that say all these other things. And for the record, I always start with human technology. Sure. Our technology is sufficient to produce things that would appear magical to the average human being. Yeah. Technology has really advanced. So that's where I start. But um, chemtrails, 
they're a real thing. And if you don't understand that, um, it's not really excusable at this point. Yeah. And can I, can I add one thing to that also? Yeah. Um, I, I used to take photos and, and video back in the old days with um, – and submit them to Jeff Rents when, when Clifford Carnicom was first coming on with that. And I had seen the phenomena since about 96, and back then people – you know, it wasn't – it just started. And people were like, oh, those are just military jets or those are just high-flying jets. But what you're reminding me of is how sometimes you'd look with the naked eye and you wouldn't even see a jet. You would just see like the contrail almost as if the, the plane was invisible or something. And then these blinking orbs that would kind of like dance through the – the trail i guess you could say and i recorded all this unfortunately i don't even have that i converted some of it to digital but um yeah it, it's a real phenomena and if, if and back then they used to spray like crazy i remember like 2000 through 2004 at least here in new jersey uh skies would be blue and then they turned to a gray cotton candy wispy oil slick within two hours well you know there's there's actually proof beyond what any human being will see um you know i grow i try to grow as much organic food as i can um, at one point, we had gotten a certain tangerine tree that produced its fruit in December because we wanted to have winter citrus. Um, what we saw was the first year it did, in fact, produce in December into January. Um, but over time, that tree got confused because of the weather manipulation. And it, at one point, didn't produce until well into spring, which is not what that plant is supposed to be doing. This year, with two blueberry bushes, we have two different varieties. Um, it should have produced and been done. And right now, I'm looking at the last of that crop. I have a passion vine, Passiflora is the plant, produces these kind of purple flowers that produce a lot of caterpillars and butterflies. Right now, last year, this plant would have been completely purple and covered. I'm looking at it right now. It's got five flowers. Um, the, the weather manipulation is actually affecting when plants are providing their flowers and fruits. Wow. 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 That's, that's, <laughs> that's incredible. And, and just on a side note, because, you know, ever since I've started my stuff, I've had people uh, ask me about chemtrails. A lot of people, you know, they said, what's your opinion on chemtrails? I was going, look, one, yeah, they're absolutely real. No, no question about that. Anyone that thinks that chemtrails is a contrail thing, you're you're just kidding yourself. You're in denial. Absolutely. But, but at the same time, I was going. Well, look from from my model, you know, from from an enclosed standpoint, they said, you know, is it is it us or is it is it the creator, you know, the builder? I go look, you know, from a design standpoint. Again, coming from the game design standpoint, I don't think it's it's the creator because it's it's too low tech. It's it. I say it's absolutely us. We're we're doing it, and it's fairly recent, you know, in in the grand scheme of things. I was going look. If you're going to do it from a builder standpoint, you know, whoever created this place, uh, you don't do it with with something as obvious like writing your name in the sky. Uh, you do it at high, you know, at super high altitudes, you know, using a more uniform uh, dispersal pattern. You you don't you know just make these giant streaks. There's only so many streaks you can put across the sky before people start noticing. Let's, let's... Well, it's it's you know it's it's not even secret. Um, that's really the frustrating yeah. part. Yeah. There's actually plenty of laws dealing with weather manipulation. To when when China had the Olympic Games, it was openly touted that they had a weather manipulation bureau. Um, I was writing for the Examiner not too long ago. I did an article on the fact yeah. that in 2009 they created some nasty blizzard with their you know their weather manipulation but yeah. here's the real kicker there's a document open to the public that the air force put out says owning the weather by 20 i think it's 25 yeah. and they yep. talk openly about using aerosols to do it so i mean it's this is the frustrating part it is not it, this is where belief you know belief being the enemy of knowing comes in yeah. because so many have chose to just simply believe something yeah. when you know and, it doesn't even take that much effort to know the truth got it hey um uh, we, we gotta we gotta go to break here for uh, sure. j just a few uh, but when we come back we'll be talking lots more about chemtrails and and lunar waves and nasa and all the fun things that's being pulled over our eyes so we'll be back with crow triple seven don't go anywhere and welcome back to strange world where the truth is often stranger than fiction I'm your host, Mark Sargent, back with Jonathan from Jersey. We are speaking yet again, third segment with uh, Crow 777. We're talking about lunar waves, all things deception. And uh, got a quick question for you, Crow, and that is, uh, because you get this one a lot, 
uh, but I but I have to ask it because people ask me all the time, and that is uh, you you film a lot of stuff you know flying you know in front of the moon, and that is uh, are they are they satellites? What, what's your what's your take? <laughs> that you know that's a that's really a tough one to answer. I can answer definitively that they are not listed satellites that we can look up. I can answer definitively that many of these things do not look like anything we have been shown. And to top it off, I just recently did a clip on this, to follow the rules of how orbits work. And this was actually the crux of the Huffington Post article where the FBI guy and the head of MUFON or whoever the heck he was Mm -hmm. looked at one of my black haloed objects that was moving very slowly, and they said, oh, that's in geosynchronous orbit. So what I did to show that it's one thing to knee-jerk a response trying to force these things to be common um, is I contacted an optics expert at the scope shop who calculated what the distance across a pixel would be at certain distances from me, specifically geosync. What we found was that particular object they were talking about, as measured by an optics expert at a scope shop, a brilliant gentleman, that this object would have been three times the size of what we were told the ISS is. But to take this problem a bit further, we're told that low Earth orbit, which is roughly 160 miles away, although interestingly I've heard descriptions that say low Earth orbit starts at Earth. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But um, we're also told that almost everything we have in orbit is between 160 and, I don't know, 400. Don't quote me. It's somewhere in that range, very close to us. And that anything out to geosynchronous, which is 22,000 miles, um, and moving very slowly, if at all, from our point of view, anything further than that, we are told, gets roasted by radiation and fails. Having said this, if we accept those rules, and bear in mind, things like the ISS whipping around in low Earth orbit, we are told, at 17,000 miles an hour or something like this, um, and that it transits the moon in less than a second. These black haloed objects that I have filmed and others have filmed, if they followed that rule, it should mean the smaller they are, the further away they are, the slower they are. We find the opposite of this all the time. The largest black halo object I have filmed, which should mean it's closer to me, is among the slowest movers I have ever filmed. And so it just doesn't follow anything we've been handed, and these things clearly do not look like satellites. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And and the distances you were mentioning uh, uh, are are pretty much go go in line with the distances I say. I say, you know, as far as the enclosure goes, uh, I, in fact, I've I've told people several times, including Jonathan here. I at this point, I don't trust anything above spy planes. I I, I can't. Uh, there's there's just too many weird. There's too many exceptions that are that are happening up there. And plus, you know, I, I've said that uh, as far as the ISS goes. It's like, okay, fine, you tell me that, uh, you know, the ISS is up there and it's doing stuff and there's people on it and they're doing all these things. I'm going, to, that's fine. Then if the ISS is up there, then why are you faking the, the, the people footage? Why are, you, why are you faking the interior shots if the tech is available? And uh, so, yeah, for me, uh, I'm, I'm with you, man. Satellites are an enigma and I'm still trying to figure out. It's like, look, I know there's stuff up there. That I have no doubt. What's up there, though? A whole other thing. Because... Well, there's, you know, what's funny is there's a trend in what's called micro satellites. Yeah. I have a clip up called Picard. We need more data or something. The reason I named it that is uh, I filmed it, went into Stellarium, saw yeah. what from the right trajectory, approximately the right speed, was named the Picard satellite. So I said, "Wow, this is one of these rare days when I got a satellite I can ID." Well, I started looking up information on Picard. It's a micro satellite. So everything about this thing matched, and yet here I am filming something that needs to be over 160 miles away from me, and it is, I think, three feet or something. The cube itself is not big at all. So how the heck can I be filming something prominent at that distance? And so, you know, it it comes into the, the argument is, are these things much closer? And I think the answer for a lot of these things, including the moon, is hell yes. Um, and I have thought experiments posted to demonstrate that the moon is not a quarter of a million miles away. And I arrived at that one day. I was filming. Thank chem you for planes. saying that. <laughs> yeah, I, I I was filming chem planes, and I came in 
and I got on uh, flight radar and um, found their distance, and they were like some of them seven to nine miles away. And yet at that distance with my good equipment, I couldn't make out color. I couldn't make out in some instances much more than the shape of a plane. And often, as Jonathan stated, I could see a chemtrail with no plane in front of it. Um, so I said to myself, if this is occurring at seven to nine miles, how in the hell am I filming something at nearly a quarter of a million miles? So what I did was is I grabbed a crater, put it in Google Earth, went up 40,000 miles, and did the thought experiment to show you that that crater um, you can see with your naked eye on the moon uh, cannot be seen in Google Earth at 40,000 miles in altitude. And then I went and updated it because I realized the crater I initially chose, you'd have to be eagle-eyed Joe to spot it. So I used a very common crater that is white called Aristarchus. And I upped the size to 40 miles. Aristarchus Crater is not 40 miles wide, but the kind of white that they often show us around it is close. So I made a 40-mile circle, did the same thing, and said at 40,000 miles, you can't even detect it's there, and the moon is six times further. Yeah. So, you know, there it is. Yeah, no. I, I, yeah, go ahead, man. I wanted to say something. He said it first. Um, I'll tell you, I had that aha moment. My mom had, had bought my brother and I a telescope. It was a little crappy, you know, bought it two guys or bradley's one of these little shops uh and we, we we hooked it up we started playing with it i looked at the edge of the moon i had it in focus used the biggest i guess magnifying loop that they had a 10x in the eyepiece and i remember sitting there my mouth just opened and i could see the edges of the moon you know the, the heat waves and all this other but i'm thinking to myself this doesn't even feel real it feels like i'm looking at like not, not just a video but it just seemed too close that this little crappy telescope could pick up this, and then they tell us, oh, we can't see anything on the moon because of this, that, or the other. You know, we have Hubble telescopes and all incredible observatories, but we can't focus on things on the moon. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I, I don't buy all these arguments of, you know, the distances that they say, like you said, or um, the optics or what they're actually projecting up there. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. 237,000 miles, uh, and, and I've stated it officially many times, not a chance. No way, and uh, and and if anything, uh, Crow, your 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 footage even just hammered at home even more, because I'm looking, I'm just going, wow, that's clear, wow, that's it, it is so crisp and so close, and it just feels wrong. You're looking at it, and you know, and I know perspective's tough for for human beings. It's in a clue I'm going to be doing down the road, but it fe- you're looking at it, and you're going, it cannot be a quarter million miles away. It can't. And, and... No, what what I did for the most of my life was looked at the moon and saw an image that was implanted there from TV, movies, and NASA. Yeah. And um, I yep. think most people see that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and... I, I just thought of, I just thought of something, Mark. Yeah. The same way they keep showing the same image from space of the Earth, they just keep showing us the same image of the moon from the Earth. You know, from yeah. the Earth. Yeah. Like we see from you know, the Earth from space. Yeah. So they can only deal in flat images. Yeah. Yeah, and the moon's a tricky thing because, you know, it's the most fo- photographed uh, object of all time. And uh, it's, you know, so they've got to get it somewhat right. But it seems to be, uh, from a technical standpoint, it seems to be falling apart as of late. And uh, Well, these things don't happen uh, in a vacuum. Um, yeah. I have always maintained that that fateful day in 2012 was happened because it was allowed to happen. I was allowed to see that. Yeah. Um, so many of the things that I have filmed have been within a hair's breadth if you get it or you don't, yeah. um, and you come to understand that uh, there's change, and that change is so independent of me. It has nothing to do with my skill level, my anything. The only thing it has to do with is I'm putting the effort and I'm available. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm there doing it. That's that's the truth. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that's how evolution possibly happens? Like when we're too dumb to get it, um, the universe kind of – forces it into our lap, so to speak, gives us those moments? I think the only evolution we will ever see on this planet is what would be equated to a spiritual evolution uh, right, or right. Uh, the human being's ability to rise to, you know, kind of the Superman archetype. Um, and we're seeing it already in the younger generations. You know, I saw this silly show on TV the other day where these guys were throwing a basketball and a Frisbee um, insane distances to hit a hoop, and they were doing it. Um, and they did it all over the place from just these incredible, unbelievable distances. And so my reaction was, well, that's pretty interesting. But had I seen that 15, 20 years ago, 
I'd have been blown away. Yeah. And yet people are kind of like frogs in the boiling water. You know, we just we've been here, so we don't understand to the degree that we should what's happening. Yeah. And that is a lot about what chemtrails, what fluoride, what aspartame, what the quality of your food. Yeah. Um, these things are all meant to retard the human ability. Yeah, sure. I agree. Hey, uh, but, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead, ahead, Jonathan. No, I was just going to say, I'm wondering if other people had perhaps come across uh, this phenomena, except that it takes a wiser person, somebody like yourself with integrity, and who's maybe even spiritually centered, to then uh, bring it to the masses. Maybe other people would just hit the delete button and say, no, 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 I can't accept this. Um, I, I guess I'm not sure exactly what you're asking me. I guess I guess if other people had experienced the same thing, if they were more indoctrinated or of the you know of the mindset like oh this can't be true therefore let me delete it, but when you have you know a certain level of integrity and stuff you feel like it's almost like I have to show this this truth or this new evidence to to people. Oh yeah yeah well, if yeah if there was other people that weren't weren't like Crow yeah yeah it also yeah it also has to be revealed to a certain person. Because Crow, you know, had, had the had the the foresight to actually go forward and, and put it out there. Where yeah, lots of people would have would have deleted it off their camera. Would have just said it's nothing. In fact, probably a lot of them have. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure a lot of them have. Um, I, I think that even you know there was one guy who had it posted since 2013, and all that time I'd been desperately trying to get someone else to corroborate. But you know, the last clip up uh, kind of underscores what we're talking about here. Um, I filmed a seemingly set of three party balloons go in front of the moon and then a little while later a single obvious party balloon go <laughs> up and uh, at one point this balloon and and it was the first day that chemtrails had started back up blatant chemtrailing we always see the high altitude ones but uh i was shooting with a telephoto and visual or what our eyes see and i was shooting with the telescope that had full spectrum and ir and uv in the full spectrum when i got into the editor as it first comes into view for the telescope, it just crosses the corner of frame, but it outgassed, and the outgas was in a locked shot, so it can't be camera flare, and it went against the prevailing wind that was you know, pushing the balloon. Mm -hmm. So at first, I didn't think much. As I thought about it for the rest of the day, I started to think, wow, are we looking at a new aerosol delivery system? Problem is, if you say this in public, you're going to get hammered because people are just going to say, you idiot, you're looking at party balloons. Point is, you don't make progress in this world unless you look at the minutia, the details, which is what so many of us can no longer see, and then you reason out all that minutia to say, is there something here? And what I knew was there's no tether. These don't look like just typical party balloons. It outgassed. I can see it. It went against the wind. And I didn't see a balloon deflate. So with just that little bit of minutia, you kind of stick your neck out on the chopping block to say, hey, is something going on here? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, what we're talking about comes up over and over again. And if you're not willing to be a punching bag, don't do this. Yeah. You mean, you mean a balloon that was like a dispersal system for something, perhaps? I'm wondering if, if that's what we're seeing. You know, I've seen plenty of balloons, and every time I've ever seen one, out gas, it deflates and falls or pops. Um, this appears to be perfectly intact at the end of the four minutes I shot it from the first few seconds that I shot it where gas is coming out of it. Top it off, a lot of other people claimed they could see it out gas twice more in the telephoto footage. Um, but the problem is, is I can't see that on my monitor. I put it on a 62 inch TV running it through an Xbox and I can detect it, I think. Um, so it's just one of those things where, you know, it's it's on the edge of a razor, but, you know, you've got to ask the question. I mean, well, what what if that's what we are looking at? Let me let me just add this, though. If people think it's too far-fetched or conspiratorial, consider that under a FOIA request, um, the Army revealed, the U.S. Army revealed that they had dropped flu and other viruses in the uh, New York subway system to see how far they would spread at one time. I think that was back in 78 or 83. I'd have to look it up, but... So it's not that they don't do these things. Yeah, yeah, good point. Hey, well, you know, in December, uh, in December 29 of, of last year, um, I filmed an orb fall down in front of the moon, and then when it got below the moon, it did a 90-degree turn into the wind and head towards chemtrails again the first day they had started up. And then a white balloon 
uh, with a tether and like little what looked like diamond reflectors on it fell right in front of the moon sometime later. And as you know, the moon is moving from our apparent point of view, and it popped and fell. So it's almost a complete mirror. You know, these are the things that I don't dismiss because I don't believe in coincidence. So in December of last year, I saw the same thing, a weird thing, chemtrails associated with chemtrails, then a balloon. Um, so that's really what pushed me to put the put the footage forward. Wow. Wow. And I mean, I'm glad people like you, again, and you and Mark are, are looking at things like this. And I appreciate you both because some people will see a cluster of four-leaf clovers and think they're just lucky. And I'm thinking, I'm moving from this location because there's radiation. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Not a chance. No, I look at everything in, in with different eyes nowadays. And I have I have for years. Um, but 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 uh, I, I got I got a question for you because uh, I get this question asked to me a lot. It kind of goes it kind of goes back with the moon thing because people will I get this email. Oh, God, maybe three or four times a day. And that is uh, uh, OK. You know, it, so so I, I, I will throw them your videos and I'll say, Okay, here's what you look about the moon. And their follow-up question is almost stacked right on top of it, which is, okay, well, what do you think about planets? And and I I say, you know, for me, I go, I, I, how, how can I, how can I believe them? You know, at this point, Uh, if if the moon is isn't what I think it is, then how can the planets be? Do you got a, uh, you got a take on that? Well, I I guess what I'm willing to say, um, you know, I see so many people putting models forward that are doing no hands-on experiments. What I'll say about the planets is this. I accept nothing NASA has handed us. I do not accept the archetype of space we've been handed, period. Yeah. So that out of the gate means everything I'm looking at is in question. Now, yeah. it's a whole other thing to turn around and say, well, it's this. I can't do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. What I can tell you is that there are no real pictures of Earth or the moon from space. Yeah. What I can tell you is everything you've ever seen from the Hubble, and believe me, I wasted – endless hours of my life uh in the 90s going through hubble imagery and being an astrophotographer trying to replicate because you bought it you you bought into the hubble thing like like everybody you you thought what people don't understand is just the descriptions of those images tell you that they're created images none of them are invisible light or very few of them they're put together you, you know you see telemetry composite mosaic um, you see all these words that just flat out tell you these are created images. And then there's the whole idea of if you could be in what we call space or free of, you know, Earth's influence outside, whatever that is, that you would not see light coming from the sun. Um, the only place you would see light is on a reflected object. And it's yeah. a bit like maybe shooting a laser through a room. You can't see it until the dust particles go through. Yeah. Um, there's people like Dollard who are freaking brilliant, and they are, you know, flat out describing to you that um, even the idea of taking a picture of the sun free of this 3D environment, you know, outside our little bubble here, you would see nothing. You would get the heat, you would get the radiation, but as the emitting source of light, you wouldn't see anything. And so many are familiar with the kind of black hole sun meme. You wonder if that's kind of the genesis of it, but... Yeah. We've been handed a, you know, an archetype, Star Trek, Star Wars, just everything has put an image of what aliens and planets and all these things should be, and and I don't accept any of it. Yeah, yeah, I didn't, and I didn't know, by the way, that because um, uh, I had mentioned uh, Eric Eric Dollard in I think geez, my second interview, I didn't know that you had uh, you had followed him a, l- a little bit. Uh, yeah, brilliant guy, fascinating guy. I don't know if he, you felt the same way I did, but when I first watched that uh that that you know that iconic interview where he's sitting in that old car and and the film students shooting him and he's asking him about the sun and he's saying you know you know he goes he goes i don't know what the sun is nobody knows what the sun you know he's and there's so much conviction but but (laughs) but but, but wait a minute I, i think what he actually says is the sun has been well understood for a long time um i think that's really what he is saying yeah um but but the reason I, I don't care what anyone says about an individual like that. To me, he is the apex of where your eyes should be for the simple reason he's doing things. Yeah. He's going out, doing the experiments, doing the work with first hand, unimpeded by polluting outside influences. And that is the main problem with what you see in all these theories, you know, Nibiru. Flat Earth, just all of it is yep. no one is going out 
and doing the field work to try to demonstrate in a first hand free of what a university told you free of what nasa has said yeah. way to demonstrate look i'm just a guy i'm doing it and this is what i'm finding yeah 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 eric eric dollar is completely underrated in my opinion and I don't know if his reputation. Uh, yeah, he gives some uh, some odd interviews. You know, he's an interesting, interesting guy, but I, I I feel bad that he's he's portrayed in that in that crazy, super eccentric light. And and I know people saying, well, you know, he's the poor man's Tesla and all and all this stuff. But it's like, no, man, he's he doesn't just think outside the box. His whole world is outside the box. Uh, everything that he put puts across, it's like really should be looked at um, with a lot more scrutiny because he's got some fantastic uh, ideas, in my opinion. So, well, any 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 individual who chooses to cast aside the you know shape and form we've been handed of everything and go out and observe it with clean eyes, they'll be in the same exact boat. They will find problems instantly with almost everything they've ever been described yeah yeah and i i gotta say one thing to that i know i I had a hard time working at ibm verizon and other big companies and you know even discussing this or trying to find people to talk about it with when i worked there because i looked at people like oh you're technically minded you might appreciate this but no this isn't an appreciated uh social uh conversation piece yeah yeah i mean you have to find the right people yeah absolutely um Quick question, uh, which which is a little off topic, but you brought it up, and that was uh, the Nibiru thing, the Planet X thing, because I was into that for you know the the, the duration. Let's put it that way. I was following it. You know, I, I had gone through all the YouTube stuff and all the internet stuff, and uh, I bought it. I I totally bought into that. And, you know, back in 2012 and uh, now and people keep are now asking me again, you know, because 2015, you know, here we are. Nothing's happened, but people keep bringing it up. They just keep moving the timetable forward. You know, it's like, oh, well, you know, it's still coming, still coming. It'll be here. And um, and I tell them now, now my opinion's completely changed because of how I view uh, this world in the universe to where I tell people it's like, look, at this point, if it shows up. If you know, if if Nibiru literally rears its ugly head in the sky, I wouldn't buy it for a second. You know, even though you may see it up there, I don't know. I I could not confirm at this point what you're actually looking at. Uh, do you got any got any opinion on that? Well, I would imagine that the average person stuck in the Nibiru loop um, yeah. probably started with Sitchin or is influenced by Sitchin. There you go. So yeah. I'll answer that question with a question. Okay. Has anyone ever seen these? magical tablets do they know the specific <laughs> magical tablets that mr sitchin wrote this whole retelling of the gilgamesh you know story mm, does yeah. anyone know what his source material was because without that if you cannot answer yes then all you have is something you've chosen to believe in yeah yeah you, it, it, and i would also point out if it's such an amazing tale these tablets are telling Where's the you know, where's the line of all the people behind him taking it further? And, you know, it's a bit like the buildings on the moon thing. Yeah. I get endless people who are upset with me because they're doing research demonstrating that there's all these structures and everything on the moon. Yeah. And they even take my images and say, look, there's a hidden base here. My response is this. If I go out tonight and I shoot the moon, and there is a base or anything on the surface of the moon, and I publish those to the public, the following day there will be a 1,000 people with better equipment than me, with worse equipment than me, with more ability than me, imaging this amazing thing that I have found. And yet what we get is this just constant line of you know, people drawing pictures around these angular things they find on the moon. Um, they're not there. They're yeah. just not there. Yeah, yeah. And, well, I'm sorry, Jonathan, you had something? I was going to say, you brought, you brought up a good point. If, if everything's possibly a projection, and we're in a dome and a flat earth and all that, right, and they have manipulation, they have the ability to manipulate these images, yeah. something like Project Bluebeam that people have talked about too as, as possibly happening one day, yeah. what if they could use a high-energy weapon similar to what possibly Tesla did with the Tunguska incident in Russia? Some people say he was trying to shoot a signal to Admiral Bird and it overshot and took out that forest. Yeah, that's an so, interesting one, yeah. 
so crazy future scenario. They decide to go underground, deep under military you know bases. They fire up Harp or CERN or whatever uh, you know technology they have. Then they create a remote event, an explosion that creates, and they blame it on a meteor that nobody ever sees or thinks they see because it's a projection in the sky. There you go. Yeah. Oh, and, so, I mean, is it possible? Is it far fetched? No, I mean, no. I, ball, I think it, I think it's possible. Absolutely. Dude, I don't even know what to say about that. It seems to me you just wrote a movie. If I was you, I would get the script going immediately <laughs> and get that off to Hollywood. Speak. <laughs> speaking of movies, I'm actually going to Hollywood next week, so I could. <laughs> Well, there you go. You're, You're in not the supposed right place to... at the right time. <laughs> uh, sp- speaking of movies, and I want to I want to get this in before the break because we got a minute twenty until the break. Um, uh, when you mentioned Sitchin and it's like where he got his ideas, you know, Jonathan and I uh, did a, a show recently on on the end of the world in film and and how it's influenced us and and uh, and and how it's portrayed. And a movie that came to mind, and I wasn't kidding when I when I said this was, and I don't know if you've ever seen it, Crow, was the nineteen fifty one. I know you're not you're not that old, uh, nineteen fifty one, uh, when worlds collide, which covered literally a giant sun, rogue sun going through our solar system and a planet that was circling it that was going to run into Earth. And I'm watching this thing, and I'd never watched the entire thing from beginning to end. And I know we got thirty seconds, but I'll get this in. Was I watched it and I was going, holy smokes, you could take the, the, the word Nibiru and stick it into every part of that script where it had the planet name that they picked, and it would absolutely play out like the whole Planet X scenario. And I was going, and I was thinking, geez, Sitchin would have actually been old enough to have seen this in the theater. I was going, could it be that this is where he got his idea instead of the tablets? So, so let, let me take us to break with a simple quote from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Space may be the final frontier, but it was made in a Hollywood basement. Wow. Perfect. Wow. I, I couldn't have yeah. come up with a better one. And we're going to break as of right now. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Strange World. Last segment of our show with Crow Triple Seven. Uh the man behind the lunar wave footage, some of the chemtrail orb footage. Uh, if anyone, seriously, you want to see some weird, weird stuff and stuff that I completely endorse, uh, just go to YouTube and type in C-R-R-O-W-777 or just Crow777 if you can't remember the first thing. Um, and what we're, I, I, I gotta, I gotta, you know, we're getting to it and I know everyone's wondering because the, there's a t- the tough question. You got to answer this one, Crow, and that is, uh, you know, you've taken all this footage of the moon. You, you've shown some really weird stuff there. Is, do you think, in your opinion, is the moon a physical structure with a holographic covering, or is it just a full-on projection in the sky? So, for a long time, I used the word hologram, and the simple reason for that is because we don't have another word. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not the right word. Um, the, the technology that we're seeing at play, I don't know how it would be described. What I can tell you, well, in the Russian research, it's described as octaves which I think is a very interesting, interesting thing, given um, those who have studied ancient um, thought processes with vibration and, you know, things of, of a similar nature. You know, you look at a rock, it's not, you know, just sitting there. It is, in fact, vibrating. Mm-hmm. Having said all this, what we are looking at, in my view, is what I will call a facade. Um, it's a facade that can't be landed on. And it's a facade that can't even be hit with anything. Now, I can demonstrate this. Since 2012, when I filmed the first lunar wave, I've probably seen maybe 100 what we're told are meteors coming from the sky. Um, In my lifetime, many more. Now, I've got thousands, many thousands of hours of lunar observation time. I've never seen anything hit the face of the moon, yet when we look at it, it appears to have been bombarded endlessly, and that's what we're told. To top it off, when we see a fireball, we're told it's burning up in our atmosphere. The moon, we're told, has no atmosphere. Not only that, it's covered, apparently, much of it in a fine powder. So if anything did hit it, you would see quite a plume that would remain visible. And yet, the moon breaks the one law that I know is absolutely bulletproof true about our existence. That law is change. Everything we experience in our existence is change. And yet that moon, if it was 100 years old the first time I saw it, it hasn't aged a day. Um, It's probably covering something because there's no reason to put a false 
image that is meant to look like something for no reason. Um, I think it's probably covering a control center, and I am slightly skewed by the Russian descriptions because so much of what he put forward lined up with what I had already come to know about the lunar wave. While much of what Hattie Bob says in that Russian research, I will never be able to vet. I'm just a person. You know, I don't have secret government facilities or some secret society to teach me or any of these things, just a guy. So some of his research goes so far off in a direction that I'll never be able to know or vet. Uh, my point is what you're looking at is not a rock in space. I will call it a facade for now because I have no other method to describe it. Sure. No, no, and I, I agree, and uh, I'm I'm right there with you. When when people ask me, they say what the moon is. I I absolutely that's what I tell them. I say, look, there's something there, obviously, but it is being covered by an illusion, some sort of uh, again, you know, it's there's there's something behind it that or you know there's something behind it. And there's something front, and people say, well, you know, is it it is it its own projection system or is it being projected upon? I'm going. It could be either, but either way, what you're looking at is is not what you're seeing well i will add this there is plenty of first-hand observation report reported you know 100 or more years ago from places like the astronomical royal astronomical society one case was a gentleman was watching jupiter about to get occulted by the moon which just means that jupiter would go behind the moon and occult it and what he saw was that jupiter turned into a black disc and traveled across the face there are numerous reports of stars being seen through a new moon or an early phasing moon. And to top it off, um, there are endless reports of during a solar eclipse that the limb of the moon becomes see-through. And I actually posted footage of this last solar eclipse we had where it shows you can see the limb of the sun through the darkened part of the moon and this has been reported a lot a lot a lot of times mm -hmm. and so we're you know the debunk on this will be oh well it's you're seeing what einstein said the light is bending around the planet but um the moon just isn't what you think and if you take the time to really dig in and look you'll even be able to find that there was a time documented by many many people in antiquity when the moon was not in our sky at all yeah yeah, spot on, and I, I love those myths and legends that they bring up because, uh, yeah, because that, that brings in a whole nother thing. It's like, look, if it's a if it's a giant body that's, well, you know, relatively giant, a quarter million miles away, do you know how tough that would be to introduce to a system versus, uh, uh, you know, having it, you know, having it be part of a much, much smaller structure? Absolutely. So, Jonathan, did you have something? No, no, I mean... This could go on a whole other two-hour conversation. Okay. Just that one point alone. So I'm going to mute out on this and listen. Okay. Okay, no worries. <laughs> no, no, no. It's cool. Um, I still have some questions. We have 20 minutes left. Uh, let's let's get to one that uh, uh, I know I promised I, was, I would ask you. Um, you. Most people don't know that you were recent, uh, recently a journalist for The Examiner. and uh, oh, uh, but, uh, but something happened. You quit. Uh, do, do you, would you mind sharing some of the circumstances around that? A lot of what I do uh, and the reason I do what I do is to help people understand the deception and the just utter damage your television and news is doing to this planet. Maybe the most dangerous weapon ever devised by man. Mm -hmm. My goal was to get hired by the examiner, which actually happened on the first try. I'm told it usually takes three or four tries. They hired me out of the gate. Mm -hmm. um, my goal was to write non-deceptive articles and this is what happened when i started to talk about the lunar wave um i actually posted one that was one room that was removed by publishers i wrote a couple other firsthand my news one of a kind couldn't get by the publisher or the editors what they required the rules of the game was that two supporting links have to support your story from a quote trusted news source, mm -hmm. um, and one of them has to be no more than 48 hours old. So here I am trying to write a f firsthand, this happened at the moon, yet I've got to go somehow come up with two existing news cycle links to support that, 
And then to top it off, I am a technical person. I have been online. I've been a webmaster. I One of my first jobs was creating the very first ads with video in them that ever went out on the Internet at three frames a second. Mm -hmm. This is what they're doing. They require, if you want, if you want to get a paycheck, it's about page views, and they know this. If you want to get paid, what you have to do is take an existing news story that is trending on Bing or some other large search engine. Mm -hmm. You have to slightly reword that story, keeping the same words in the title and the same words from that title in the first couple of lines of your article. You have to further echo the keywords that were making it list in that search engine minimally six times in the article. Wow. And for anyone who's mildly aware, they will understand that words are numerically coded in news and movies and everywhere else with gematria numerology. Mm -hmm. um, there's plenty of places on the web you can go to learn about this. Mm -hmm. So in essence, what they're requiring every journalist to do except the people creating the stories, is to go out and echo verbatim the story with the same words, slightly reworded, and then echo the coded keywords six to seven times in every article. You don't do that. You don't get paid. I tried. The system is rigged, and I quit. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. So now man. I'm unemployed again. Well, that's not <clears throat> true. The Higher Side Chat um, – Greg Carlwood at the Higher Side Chat hired me for a 10-article series and allows me to write unimpeded. Um, but other than that, I basically lost my employment. Wow. Wow. Yeah, and, and um, uh, Higher Side Chats, they do some good work. And uh, I, I unfortunately, unfortunately, they got to Eric before Eric's group before they got to me, which is fine. You know, I, again, I'm not going to ever say anything bad about Eric and his stuff. And he actually did a, an excellent interview on the Higher Side Chats. They, they do a nice job. Uh, he, he's the apex of, of podcast interviewers. He really is the gold standard. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, if you, Higher Side, if you're listening, you'll be more than happy to be on there because you, uh, you make people look good. Be careful! I don't think he takes by ask. <laughs> oh crap! Uh, I mean, I didn't. I didn't don't, ask. Yeah, don't, don't shoot your foot off. Oh crap! Well, I, I won't send him an email or anything. If he wants to get a hold of me, he will. But I think he's covered flat Earth at, at, by this point. Um, uh, let's get in because uh, I, I know there's a few other questions I want to ask you, but I, I don't want to miss this one because, I, as you know, I'm kind of a. Uh, I've got my opinion on this, and that is NASA. Uh, NASA, you know, in my opinion, has been covering that. You know, the, since they were created in 1958, uh, they have been the biggest fabrication, the fabrication since day one, in my opinion. They a ton of money has been sunk into that into that organization, and uh, in my opinion, it should it should be winding down. You know, anybody that's out there that's a subcontractor, really give your money to other groups because NASA is at I believe its end. Uh, what what is your take on NASA? Well, it's not just at his end. They're putting private corporations in place as quickly as they can yeah. because a private corporation doesn't have to tell you jack diddly or squat. Yeah. They do what they want, and you have no recourse. Yeah. I can sum up that an answer to that question in one very simple way. Right. I'll tell you what NASA's mission is and what it has always been. NASA's mission is to ensure that you have absolutely no idea what's going on above your head further than you can see. Bingo. Ab dead spot on absolutely uh f for me it was it was they were it was a control system no doubt you know uh again 1958 they literally militarized space uh again most people don't understand they say they think it's like star trek you know that nasa is a peaceful you know side organization of the government i'm going no it is a military arm of the government it's based on military well, te technology it has nothing to do with space because uh, <laughs> you know as, as i've maintained nobody goes above low earth orbit you know the movie gravity yeah um you watch that and you can't tell that wasn't shot in space that's how good it is yeah you know and, and there's the tools nasa's working with but in the beginning of that movie they tell you the truth it is life is impossible in space and the opening text yeah. it tells you that very thing and i maintain nothing goes above low earth orbit to include machines and i don't even think that we can think of low earth orbit as whatever we would consider space to be and there's even astronauts on record i have a, a clip posted now with a clip from nasa or a link in my article that's where it is yeah my last article 
Number four, there is a link to an astronaut talking about the Orion Project, stating flat out, we cannot go above low Earth orbit, and that's what the Orion Project is all supposedly about, which is a bit of a smack in the face for a nation who spent Lord knows how much money going to the moon, we were told. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How much money? I mean, somebody should go out there and uh, do the do the legwork on this in adjusted dollars. From... Hundreds and hundreds of millions. Of billions. Or billions, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, probably, yeah. probably, I wouldn't even be surprised to see it push into trillions. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, because, yeah, once you start that early, I mean, people don't realize, like, look, that's 60, that's, that's the better part of, of 60 years ago. It's uh, there's so much that has been spent in so many programs, but at the same time, with all that money spent, there's been almost no uh, uh, visible progress. You know, not not progress we would expect. It's like, fine. So you went to the moon. You know, you you supposedly circled it six times. You landed five. You know, Apollo thirteen did its thing. Um, but then that's all you did. You know, there's no moon bases. No other countries went there. Uh, the space shuttle program. Why that wind down? For no apparent reason, you know, uh, all all the deep probes that you know don't that never turn around and take video of of, of the Earth, uh, real time footage. Because there are no deep probes. Exactly, you, there are no deep at, probes. <laughs> when you look at Mars, you know, I saw some. You know, if people would just understand that the goal of television and movies is very ancillarily entertainment. Yeah. There is a whole subtext, a whole encoded storyline some big bang that i was researching yeah. um where it's about the mars rover and the character in charge of that the engineer in charge of that yeah. flat out states in an offhand kind of comedic comment that what are you talking about you're looking the mars images are the desert outside of barstow yeah now people have and and you know i'm a, i i've been working digital i'm pretty good in photoshop there were images of the rover taken on earth and there were some things on the rover, on the Mars rover that were had color. People noticed that when it was supposedly up on Mars, these colors were wrong. So they opened it up in Photoshop and corrected the colors back to look as they should. And what they demonstrated is that all they're doing is just skewing everything to a rusty red. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's not it, even it, that. It's not even like a process. It's literally just skewing color. Yeah. Yeah, and, and skewing it to the most cliche color, you know, the color that the public would buy into. It's like, oh, yeah, well, it's obvious, you know, because all the movies, you know, hint at, you know, the red, well, there was, you know, the movie called The Red Planet, literally. Of course, and, you know, what was funny is for the longest time we were told that the sky was red, and then images somehow got out that showed blue in the sky, and uh, they came back and said, oh, well, that happens at dawn. So on Mars, it's the opposite. Here we get red in the sky. When the sun goes down on Mars, we get blue. Yeah. There's but Marco, to get red by the way because it's the longest light wave. So getting the shortest light wave is a bit of a you guys are morons and we can tell you anything. Yeah, Jonathan. Yeah, I was going to say I'm, I'm I'm willing to loan if NASA's listening to this. I'm willing to loan them my smartphone and my laptop because I think that's more powerful than anything they had in '69 if they want to try you know building a rocket again. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know that's that's kind of the funny thing is if you look at you know Elon Musk whoever's playing that character, um, he is showing you a identical capsule to Apollo that's been spruced up a bit. Yeah. But here's the question. If they went to the moon, and you know we've got basically a little more modern of the same rig that we were shown back then, um, and your most powerful computer was a Casio wristwatch or whatever it is they tell us, Yeah. Why can't we just jump in something today and go back? Why is it like this big, prolonged, um, we got to get this over to private industry, we oh, can't yeah. afford it, they got to figure out all these problems that we figured out before we even had color TV. Um, you know, it's it's all just, come on, if you can't, if you can't see it, uh, that's a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, can, I, can I ask one other question now? Yeah. Do you get upset, Crow? Like, I, I get angry um or upset more at people being dumbed down and 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 really dumbing down you know like the intelligence of it all than i do those that are genuinely debunkers or just don't know any better because they're miseducated like i i, I guess i guess i get I, I get upset when people insult your you know your intelligence with with these obvious questions which, which seem obvious and apparent to us 
So you mean mad at the people doing the deception or mad at the people not understanding the deception? No, not, yeah, not mad at the people that don't understand the deception, but those that literally, yeah, I guess doing the deception and thinking like, really? Like, do you think I'm that stupid? Like, it's such an insult to, to our intelligence as a collective. Yeah, to think I, we've come know, so far. And it's a disservice. The thing. It, it's a bit like facing the debunkers on YouTube. I don't even watch the videos. Um, the how I become aware of it is people commenting, and I just don't expend a single brain cycle on that. And I would also add, one of the goals of all this false news is to put you into an, a heightened emotional state, to make you cry, to make you mad, to make you overjoyed. It's a an emotional manipulation. The reason this is done is because human beings are the most susceptible to influence at these times. Yeah. Um, you can even go back and look at the history of, you know, the darker side of magic, where the very key was to put someone into a high emotional state and then influence them in the way you had in mind. So uh, the, the, the answer is no, um, it doesn't bother me. I don't care. Um, it is what it is. I'm going to do what I do and try to keep an even keel and reside completely free of the influence of the intent of the Decepticons. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> maybe right. I'm just too passionate for the uh, underdog and the truth. I just, <laughs> maybe it's just misconstrued for anger, and it's, you know, hey, I don't um, know. Hey, Crow, since, uh, uh, you know, this has been brought up to me a whole bunch of times, and in fact, it was one of the, the cruxes of my clues, and I'm glad that other people have latched onto it, but I, I, and Jonathan's mentioned it to me several times, but from a photographer's standpoint, um, taking pictures of the Earth from space, if you, in your opinion, uh, is any, any picture, you know, because I, I always said, look, there's, up until 2004, there was literally only one picture of the Earth from space even released on the Internet, uh, by NASA, do you you buy in any anything? Is there is is it true what I think that ninety nine percent or ninety nine point nine nine percent of everything you see on the internet when you say, say the Earth from space is just a composite or a piece of crap? Well, let me let me apply the standards to which you and I are subjected. Mm -hmm. You or I go to court and we're caught lying. Yeah. Everything that comes out of our mouth after that is no longer admissible in a court of law. Mm -hmm. So the very people who are applying these rules to us are also applying deception. So the simple answer is, is I accept none of it. I take none of it seriously. And at the end of the day, we have now reached a point where we can't even tell. So really what we have to go on is past examples of just open, bold-faced fraud. Got it. Um, at this point, you look at a movie like Gravity, if you showed that to anyone, they couldn't tell you that wasn't shot in space. You can't tell the difference. Yeah. Um, point is, uh, we can do things like look at rocket launches. And I have on my channel footage of things that should be in low Earth orbit. I can easily film them, yet there is not a single piece of rocket launch footage that I am aware of that shows a rocket going all the way out of our atmosphere. And yeah. I could film it past that. I could film it in orbit. I could film it heading out into space, and yet what we see is they launch, they arc out over the ocean hard. There's even footage where they're not just arcing over the ocean, they're coming back down. Yeah. So I maintain that nothing is going above low Earth orbit, and that's where I will make my calls uh, with regard to imagery. I think a lot of it is done with really big scopes down here. Yeah. Can I, can I ask you both a question real quick? Yeah. Um, are there any photos from space of Earth that has constellations in the background, in, including the proper depth of field and, and distance relative to the Earth? That because I can't think of any space photos where the Earth isn't just in a black well, I frame. Well, technically, I think technically, even looking at that is a problem. I get the question all the time with my footage, and the truth is, um, you have to have a really bright star near the Moon to even make it possible. And the real truth is, is I would have to underexpose. Um, or overexpose the moon to see the star because it's nowhere near as bright. So the problem becomes that if that was ever used as a point of contention, uh, the explanation is true and easily applied. Um, where when you're oh, shooting something really bright to get something much dimmer in frame, you're not going to see it. No, what I was thinking is, I, I know what you're saying, and I use a center polarized lens, a circular polarized lens that you can turn on mm -hmm. most of my camera uh, lenses. 
But I was thinking, what if they made just a smaller one that just blocked out the Earth or the reflectiveness of the moon, right? And cut that down with like an ND100 filter and then leave like a time, you know, leave it open for 30 seconds uh, to capture the stars behind it. So what's ever in center of frame would be. Then you should see it because even just the um, night before last, I was using my full spectrum camera. And what I do is I use the auto ISO feature so that when I pull away from the moon, it overlights mm-hmm. the sky, which allows me to track things beyond. But what I can often see is stars that are so dim, I can't see them with binoculars. I couldn't see them in any other way. So um, I think what you're saying is, yeah, they could do that. Okay. Hmm. Wow. Well, um, we got three minutes left. So what else do we Well, I, I, I would mention, you know, here, here's kind of a catch-22 um, that goes on on the Internet. You know, uh, you have gotten so many interviews quickly out of the gate and i know you've mentioned my work in so many places which i appreciate oh yeah it makes people aware but what tends to happen on the tail of that is that they begin to say that i am somehow connected with your theories and um i am just stating for the record um that i belong to absolutely no group on this planet and all the research that i do is a hundred percent independent of any organization meme um, idea, label of any kind. And the reason that I do that yeah. is to try to stay as unpolluted as I can. And while I appreciate your mentioning me, I just want to state on the record that what I do is a very independent thing. Oh, yeah, no, 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 no offense taken at all, man. As a matter of fact, I, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't expect that you would listen to a lot of my interviews, but I state up front with people, uh, regardless if they ask about you or if I bring it up, I say, look, I go. I, I, you know, I'm bringing you up, but I'm bringing you up strictly as a, uh, um, as a, as part of the model. You know, it it works well for part of my model, and that is, look, if you want to discredit the moon, as weird as that sounds, <laughs> not discrediting a person. If you want to uh, discredit a planetary body like the moon, absolutely look at your stuff on YouTube. Right, and uh, I, and again, I appreciate it. But also another thing that happens, and other people have done exactly this, mm-hmm. is then they're asked about the research I'm doing, and then they get it wrong. <laughs> and so then everybody walks away thinking, yeah. you know, whatever that person said, um, and, and it's actually in reality quite often it's not even close to, to what I've said in public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here Again, if, if you're adding on to what I'm saying about our reality, what we perceive and what we are told is, is, has been a deception our entire lives, then great, fantastic. Um, as far as your endorsement goes, no, I, I completely understand where you're coming from. And uh, believe me, I, I respect your your stance and everything you do uh, at this point. And, and I, the fact that you're on the show, I, it's just I, I couldn't be couldn't be happier. I was I was glad. Again, it seemed inevitable that we were going to cross paths. Don't know why. Uh, you know, it's just, <laughs> that's funny. Cause, cause you were going to be locked up in the same cell together. Oh. At the, uh... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. No, well, they I'm, round I'm, us th- up. I'm thinking if you, if you cite a guy's research enough, um, in interviews, that might happen. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we just seem to be keep, keep circling around and, you know, we're talking to the same people. And, and again, Lisa Harrison, who I think was my third interview, uh, you know, she said, uh, she, she just brought you up out of the blue, and, and people ask me my opinion of your stuff. I was like, oh, absolutely, I love his stuff. So, I'm not sure who that is, I guess. Oh, you, uh, that's all right. I'll send you a link. Um, so 30 seconds left. Crow, you got the floor. You got any parting shots? Um, you know, thanks so much for having me. Um, if people want to follow me uh, beyond what I put in videos, the Higher Side Chats will be covering at least another five articles where I can say anything I want, and I have, and I will. The next article is going up to dare tomorrow, and it's on the age of deception. Um, the water is boiling, in my opinion, and I'm kind of not pulling my punches as much as I used to. Uh, I tend to try to slowly get into the things that I've come to understand so that people don't get scared off out of the gate. Got it. So I guess that's what I would say. Fantastic, man. Thank you very much, and we are out of here until Thank next you, time. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Jonathan. Yep. Bye, everybody. Thank you. How bad is it, sir? It's not good, but at least she's not beginning to crack up. She's beginning to crack up. Ah!